Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third of this term's uh, Faculty of Classics webinars. My name is James Warren. I'm uh, currently chair of the faculty board, and I'm also here as one of the uh, panelists this evening. Um, I'm here as uh, ancient uh, professor of ancient philosophy and someone who has uh, in various ways been interested in Xenophon, Xenophonies of Colophon for some time. I'm joined this evening by um, uh, one of uh, the group of new appointments to the faculty uh, this academic year, Dr. Henry Spellman, who is uh, Assistant Professor of Classics and a Fellow of Christ College. Henry's research interests focus on uh, early Greek poetry. Um, in particular, he's worked on the poetry of Pindar, um, but he also has an interest in Xenophanes. And we very much hope that a kind of discussion between the two of us and concerning the different ways in which we've engaged with Xenophanes' work um, will be interesting, enlightening and uh, fun. So what I'm going to do, we're going to sort of cut this into two um, sections to begin with. Henry is going to start and say something about Xenophanes from his perspective. Then I'm going to take over. Then we're going to have a bit of chat between us and then we'll make sure we leave hopefully 20 minutes or more for questions um, from you. So if you have any questions that arise while we're talking, please um, uh, type them into the Q&A box that you can um, access at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then we will um, turn to those in the last part of the hour. Great. So, Henry, if you're there and turn on your camera, then I'll hand over to you. Hi. Thank you so much, James. So I, I'm, I'm afraid that the title of this talk rather gives away our whole shtick. So we'll be talking about an ancient poet who is also a philosopher or an ancient philosopher who is also a poet or maybe just best an ancient poet philosopher. So. Professor Warren is the ancient philosopher, and I'm the literature person, and we're going to try and do a sort of duo act here, Laurel and Hardy. So the Cambridge Classics faculty puts James in the B caucus with the other philosophers, and it puts me in the A caucus with the other literature people. And Xenophanes of Colophon, if he had to worry about caucuses, he'd clearly have to fully belong to both. And I think it's really important that he is, in fact, studied in both the A caucus among the literature folk and in the B caucus among the philosophy folk. I also think on a broader level, it's really important to the way that we do classics here at Cambridge, that we do have the literature people and the philosophical people working together to wrap our heads around an ancient author who doesn't neatly align with disciplinary boundaries. So personally, I know I've learned a whole lot from reading Professor Warren's published work and from conversations with him. But I've also learned that I, I don't think I'm smart enough to talk about Xenophanes actual philosophical thought. So what interests me here instead is firstly Xenophanes as a poet, and then secondly Xenophanes as a historical figure. So what are the context that we can use to understand Xenophanes a little bit better? What is the social background, his historical background, and how do we use those to understand what makes all this stuff possible? Where does it come from? So what does it mean for our understanding of the ancient Greek world that we've got this really original, maybe even counter-traditional thinker who is using the traditional medium of poetry to put his thoughts out there? So what is the social and the intellectual background of Xophanes? Where does all this stuff come from? So he's one of the very earliest of the thinkers usually labeled as pre-Socratics from whom we have a pretty substantial body of verbatim textual citations, even if it's just fragments. So there's a special interest here in what are the social bases, what are the intellectual bases, the context that make all this poetry possible. So James, if we go to the first slide, please. So one of the things that really fascinates me about Xenophanes is the degree to which he was just a normal poet. So here in fragment one, we've got a description of an ideal symposium, of an ideal occasion in which we're coming together and drinking together. Um, this is a paradigmatically elite occasion. 
it's really important for the performance, for the perpetuation of elite social identity. And paradoxically, one of the things that really strikes me, at least about the first half of this fragment, is just how normal it is. When I read at least the first half of this fragment, this reads to me like it could be written by just about any elegiac poet of the fifth century of the sixth century BCE. So Xenophanes has some very, very unusual ideas, as Professor Warren will go into in a second, but at least the first half of this fragment looks pretty much like business as usual. So the description of the symposium itself looks like business as usual to me, a literature person, and then things start looking a little bit more unusual when Xenophanes starts to talk about the things that one should talk about at a symposium. So we get this prohibition against talking about the titans, the giants, and the centaurs. And that is absolutely bread and butter, traditional poetic myth. But Xenophanes won't have any of that at his symposium. So first of all, because it's purely fictional, it's just made up, plasmata, just made up. And then secondly, because there's nothing useful in it. Indeed, these stories might be actually harmful to the audience. So I think that in a sense, what we see here in this fragment is that Xenophanes is evoking this deeply traditional performance setting, deeply traditional social setting of the symposium. And then he's putting something really new and interesting right at the center of it. So his pure words are gonna be replacing the sort of things that people would talk at about any other symposium. So he's thinking about hymning a God, but as Professor Warren will tell us in a second, the God he's thinking about hymning here is really, really profoundly different from the gods that are being hymned at countless other symposia throughout the Greek world. So I select this fragment because I think here we can see a couple of the contexts that are important for understanding Xenophanes. So first of all, we've got the intellectual context of poetic tradition. And then secondly, we've got the social context of the symposium itself. So James, could you hit the next slide, please? So I'm also interested in Xenophanes' context in another more obvious and literal sense, which is the actual context of his life, his biography, and how the circumstances of his lived experience might affect his thought. So as is the case with most of these early Greek intellectual figures, we know pretty much next to nothing about Xenophanes' actual life. One thing we do know for certain is that he was born out there in Colophon, in Asia Minor, what's today Turkey, and then he travels to Magna Graecia, so Sicily and down around the boot of Italy. And the other thing we know for certain is that he lived for a really, really long time. And the reason we know that is this fragment here, which is now on the PowerPoint. So scholars have traditionally taken a little bit more about Xenophanes' biography from this fragment. So it's been traditionally thought that this fragment is de describing Xenophanes' actual literal wanderings around the Greek world from city to city without a settled base. So I think there are a couple problems with that interpretation of the fragment. So first of all, on, on a much larger scale, the other fragments of Xenophanes don't seem to be talking about a man who's wandering from city to city without any defined place in the world. And then secondly, if we look at the sort of stories that other people are remembering or even inventing about Xenophanes, those don't seem to be stories about somebody who's just wandering around the Greek world without any home. But if we focus just on the Greek of this little fragment on a, on a very fine grain level, this fragment isn't about the wanderings of Xenophanes' physical body throughout the Greek world. Rather, what he's talking about here is the wandering of his thought, his frontes. Yeah? And I think that what Xenophanes is talking about here isn't his own physical wanderings. Rather, it's about the circulation of his poetry throughout the Greek world, his poetry that is bearing his thought all around the Greek world from place to place. So on my reading of this fragment, Xenophanes isn't some sort of indigent wandering performer of one sort or another. He's actually a major Panhellenic intellectual figure already during his lifetime. On my understanding of Xenophanes, just as a person, 
He is an entirely normal elite Greek male, and he is a major intellectual figure who's very much aware of that. So for me, there is nothing remotely marginal about Xenophanes. However strange and unusual his ideas may be, he is entirely central in many senses. So this all plugs into to a larger interest for me, which is this idea of texts circulating around the early Greek world. Um, I mentioned earlier that Xenophanes is the earliest among the pre-Socratics to leave behind this substantial corpus, even if it's mostly fragments like this, this substantial corpus of verbatim texts. And part of the reason that we can still read Xenophanes today must be that his poems were already circulating during his lifetime. That makes perfectly good sense. So we have lots of poets in this period who are talking about their poems enduring through time, talking about their poems circulating throughout the Greek world. And we also have a lot of early authors who lived not too late after Xenophanes, who are pretty clearly reacting to his poetry, pretty clearly reacting to his thoughts. I think it's safe to say his texts were circulating around the Greek world. And this is one of the really important things that's happening in this sort of broad moment of Greek intellectual history. More and more, we've got this sense of an interconnected Greek intellectual world in which we've got poems, in which we've got ideas that are circulating, circulating all about everywhere. Probably has something to do with the growing importance of the technology of writing. Okay, so we've got so far a number of contexts in which we might think about Xenophanes. We've got the intellectual context of poet tradition, social context of the elite symposium, and then this sort of overarching larger context of a Greek intellectual world. And James, if you go to the next slide, I'll talk about one more context for understanding Xenophanes. And that is the context that he himself creates within his own work by the figures he's putting himself alongside, by the other figures that he's attacking. Now, so first on the left-hand side of the PowerPoint, we've got Xenophanes attacking Homer and Hesiod, who are the most famous, the most canonical, the most pan-Hellenic poet, poets that are out there, probably the two greatest intellectual authorities in the entirety of the Greek world. And according to Xenophanes here, Homer and Hesiod have attributed to the gods all the things that are shameful among human beings, adultery, thievery, and so on. So as we will see in a moment, Xenophanes theology very much does not have a place for gods who commit adultery and deceive one another and so on or so forth. Xenophanes, on his telling of it, Homer and Hesiod get the nature of the gods radically, radically wrong. So in the other fragment there on, on the right side of the PowerPoint, we've got Xenophanes attacking another figure. And this is Pythagoras, who was not a poet, but was some sort of weird intellectual figure who believed that the soul was eternal and that the soul returned to the world in some different form after death. So here we have Pythagoras who can supposedly recognize the soul of his dead friend that's been reincarnated in a puppy. We might be we might ask how exactly Pythagoras could recognize the soul of his friend in the whelp of a puppy, maybe some sort of plaintive sound in the bark or something like that reminded of in the friend. But again, this is supposed to be entirely off base. Pythagoras looks a little bit ridiculous here. So just as Homer and Hesiod get the nature of the gods wrong, so too here Pythagoras is entirely barking up the wrong tree. Sorry for the pun, that just came to me. Okay, so Homer, Hesiod, Pythagoras, uh, all of them, according to Xophanes, are just deeply, deeply wrong about the world. And it seems pretty clear to me that why part of why it's worthwhile for Xenophanes to be attacking these figures is because they are, in some sense, his rivals. In some sense, they are claimants to the same sort of authority, the same sort of wisdom to which he would have us believe he has a much, much better claim. So these days, Homer and Hesiod are studied in the A caucus with literature folk like me, and Pythagoras is studied in the B caucus with philosophical, po philosophical folk 
like James. Um, but what I find really interesting about the combination of these two fragments is that we can see that Xenophanes is setting himself up to a, as a rival, and indeed a superior rival, to a series of figures who cross over disciplinary boundaries just like Xenophanes himself does. So Xenophanes, he's a deeply, deeply critical thinker in more than one sense, and I'm feel very certain that he would think that all of my scholarship was totally a waste of time. And I know for certain that Xenophanes would find a whole lot of stuff to criticize about the Cambridge Classics faculty, but we're still doing our best to understand him in new and different complementary ways. And to do so, we really need to put our heads together to understand this ancient reality that doesn't really line up neatly with the disciplinary categories that we've invented to study antiquity. That's it for me. Thanks, Henry. Um, I've got um, quite a lot of things I'd like to ask you to say more about, but perhaps if I can get some of my material on the table first, then we can have something of a, of a more rounded picture of some of the output that you've already drawn our attention to. Lovely. I shall disappear until then. Okay. So I want to start with one of the fragments that Henry mentioned, this censure of Homer and Hesiod, in particular, uh, the criticism of their uh, depiction of the gods. And it's a moral censure in this case, I think. The idea is that Homer and Hesiod are somehow um, wrong to describe gods as engaging in the sorts of activities that would generate censure if a human were to do them. Now, you might think, well, perhaps that's perfectly okay. Um, after all, gods are gods and they can do things that humans couldn't get away with. But it, it seems to me very much that the tone of this fragment is that actually it would be wrong to depict gods as somehow worse than humans. And therefore, Homer and Hesiod must be mistaken insofar as they describe the gods as doing this kind of thing. But if you take a look uh, at the fragment on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see that, that Xenophanes criticism of what you might call the earlier hexameter tradition, the epic didactic tradition of depicting the gods, goes far further than a criticism just of the kinds of things they show the gods doing, the kinds of actions they do. Xenophanes seems to have a more wholesale um, problem with the kind of picture of the gods that you get in Homer and Hesiod, and that therefore has been more generally adopted, insofar as he seems also to think that um, all of these are mistaken insofar as they depict the gods in an anthropomorphic fashion. So here you have him saying that mortals think that the gods are born. They have clothes, speech, and a body just like their own. And although on the face of it, that sounds like just a descriptive statement, um, I think um, it's pretty easy to put that into a context in which that in fact is part of a critical and um, a, a critical perspective that describes this kind of feeling as incorrect. By the way, this might be why um, Xenophanes is interesting to later ancient writers like Clement of Alexandria, who is the person we get this fragment quoted by, precisely because Xenophanes seems to be um, rather more um, in tune with the kind of notions of divinity that someone like Clement would think appropriate. So here are two more bits from Clement, and here I think we can begin to see um, the beginnings of an argument. Arguments are the kinds of thing I'm interested in because that gives me something to talk about that doesn't require me to know any content about anything. I can pull apart the structure of an argument without knowing anything much myself. On the other hand, here we have a really interesting example of a kind of approach to philosophical argumentation that I want to say uh, Xenophanes is one of, if not the earliest representative of. Uh, so I want to make the case that Xenophanes is um, one of the philosophers for whom 
we have the earliest examples of thought experiments. Thought experiments as kind of imaginative um, thinking, considering alternative possibilities and using that imaginative thinking to cast light on how we do and indeed should think of the world. So on your left here, you get another kind of descriptive claim. This seems like an ethnographical um, claim. It's an observation about the way different people depict the gods. So Ethiopians say that their gods are black and snub-nosed, Thracians that they're blue-eyed and red-haired. And it's pretty obvious what the implication is here, namely that each group of people um, depicts the gods as being like themselves. So Ethiopians say that the gods look like Ethiopians look. Thracians say that the gods look like Thracians look. So you have these people at the, in the very south, for example, of um, Xenophanes' world, the Ethiopians, and the Thracians who are at the very north of um, Xenophanes' world. Greeks are somewhere in the middle. Now, you might expect him to say, well, that's just because Ethiopians and Thracians are terribly misguided. One of them because it's far too hot to think, another because it's too cold to think properly. We Greeks have got it right because we depict the gods as looking like Greeks. But if you look on the right hand side here, you'll see he takes this um, observation further. And this is the imaginative leap that allows him to make some explanatory inferences about what's going on. So this fragment says, but if oxen and horses and lions had hands and could write with them and make things like humans do, then horses would draw images of the gods looking like horses and oxen like oxen and each species would give them bodies just the same as the bodies that they themselves have. Now, the idea there is that we're expanding this observation we had about Ethiopians and Thracians, no longer about different kinds of uh, or groups of people, but different species. So if we've, as it were, decentered um, the Greek notion of the gods, Perhaps the idea there was, well, perhaps it's the case that when Greeks depict the gods as they do, they only depict them that way because that's what Greeks look like. Similarly here, we begin to undermine even the anthropomorphic ass uh, assumption itself, because it's no longer obvious that the gods look like Greeks. Maybe the gods don't really look like humans at all. Maybe they o we only think of them as being like humans because we're human, just as it seems appropriate to think that Ethiopians say that the gods look like Ethiopians, because that's what Ethiopians look like. So the idea is a kind of undermining of assumptions, and this imaginative experiment allows us to come up with an appropriate explanation for why we might think that the gods look like the way we think they look, which undermines any force that that assumption might have. We can no longer rely on that as something that is um, a veridical, that can, that can actually be relied upon to guarantee truth. Our view of the gods seems to depend on ourselves and our perspective. And that's uh, another theme in Xenophanes' thought that I want to emphasize. Well, if God isn't um, anthropomorphic, what is he like? What is it like? Well, here are some more um, claims about God that Xenophanes seems to make. It seems that once he's undermined the anthropomorphic assumption, what we have is instead room to, um, uh, to set out a very different notion of what a divinity might be like. So on the left-hand side, you get a sort of... Um, uh, another kind of view of what God might be, this time a kind of another kind of negative claim that one God, greatest among gods and men, not like mortals in body or thought. I think that's quite important as well. So perhaps God doesn't even have to think like us, let alone look like us. And what does God think like? Well, God thinks in a really interesting way. So on the top of your right hand screen, we've got this idea that says without toil, without ponos, God shakes everything with his mind's intelligence. 
So we've got some notion of God being an active presence in the world, causing some sort of physical reaction. But God doesn't do that in the way that we would have to shake things. God does it with his noose, just through his intelligence. Why might that be? Well, here's another argument, in fact, at the bottom of the right screen. So God remains always in the same place, not moving. There's no kinesis, nor is it fitting that he moves from one place to another. The notion of fittingness is really important there. It's not prepon. It doesn't epiprepe in the Greek for this God to move about. Somehow the idea seems to be it would be below God's dignity or inappropriate to think that God has to zip around to get things done. Um, similarly, perhaps there was a feeling that the way that Homer and Hesiod dis, um, depicted the gods acting similarly wasn't prep on, wasn't appropriate. But consider, for example, how in Homeric epics, sometimes gods can't intervene because they're just in the wrong place when something's happening. Well, that seems a bit undignified or inappropriate to Xenophanes. His God can get things done no matter what, just with um, some activity of his noose, of his intelligence. Um, there are all sorts of other things, though, that, that are, are, are really interesting qualifications on what Xenophanes is now saying. On the one hand, he seems to be intensely critical of unjustified assumptions on the parts of gods and indeed the general populace, of, oh, sorry, of, of, on the part of poets and the general populace about what gods are like. And he too then is appropriately modest and cautious about the kinds of conclusions he's prepared to draw about the gods. And this is why I think Xenophanes is often cited, even in um, the later ancient philosophical tradition itself, as standing at the head of a kind of sceptical train of thinking, a train of thought that um, is uh, modest about the possibilities of knowledge, at least about certain kinds of question. So on the left, you have um, a kind of interesting mixture of optimism and caution. From the beginning, the gods didn't show all things to mortals, but in time by searching, they discover better. So the idea here seems to be that mortals, in each, at least initially, are uh, left to their own devices in terms of um, acquiring knowledge and understanding about the world. How might we do that? Well, we have to go searching. Zertuntes. And if we do that right, we might discover things. Um, so it's, it's, as it were, down to us to make um, cognitive progress. But even then, there might be limits to what we can um, achieve. If you look on the right hand side, here's a really important fragment from Xenophanes. It's important because it's one of the very earliest um, indications of a thought about the conditions for knowledge, formal conditions for something to count as a bit of knowledge. Let me explain what I mean. Xenophanes says, and no man has seen what is clear, sorry about the typo, nor will there ever be anyone who has knowledge about the things I say, no one who's eidos, who's knowledgeable about the things I say, about the gods and about all things. For, if someone should happen to say precisely what's the case, since he would nevertheless not know, but opinion covers all things. <clears throat> so uh, the idea there seems to be that um, knowledge is uh, requires you to do more than just happen to say something true. Um, to know something is not merely to, by happenstance or accident, come across it. Um, rather, something else needs to be added for you to count as knowledgeable. Something needs to be added. Quite what that is isn't quite clear, but it might be something like direct access, direct uh, observation, 
or something of the following. Merely stating a truth might just be by accident. So I might come out with a true claim about the gods. But if I haven't seen the truth, then I don't count as knowing it. I need to be able, as it were, to confirm that what I say is true. Some kind of second order awareness of the truth of what I'm saying. That's what's required for knowledge. Now, this is all relatively early in the tradition. But um, I think you can see something very similar in perhaps the, the, the most important um, classical um, statement of a certain condition for knowledge, which is in Plato's Meno and is called Meno's Paradox. Meno says, well, how will I ever acquire knowledge um, if I don't know what I'm looking for in the first place? And then even if I should find it, I need to know that the thing I found is the thing I was looking for, for me to be able to say for sure that I've acquired knowledge about it. And here you have Xenophanes saying something, I think, very similar. Mino's paradox um, managed to occupy Plato for a number of works and then on into Aristotle and beyond. And perhaps Xenophanes um, ought to get some of the credit for those kinds of uh, notions. <clears throat> now, on the left now, you have a kind of general statement about a kind of epistemic caution. Let these things be believed to be like the truth. Um, now, quite what this amounts to is really interesting because it's not obvious what each of these three principal elements amounts to what um what the point of what the force of saying these things are believed they're um they're, as it were things that are kinds of doxa a belief rather than a bit of knowledge what the notion of resemblance is here and what the notion of truth is the idea seems to be something like the following that the best we might be able to come up with are not truths necessarily but things that are as like the truth as possible. Perhaps they are plausible, perhaps they're persuasive, perhaps they are consistent with as much as we can observe. Those are the, the opinions we should adopt in, in preference to any that are less well supported or less consistent with what we observe, even if they nevertheless fail to be um, confirmed or they fail this additional test that might qualify them as being a case of knowledge. So it's not obvious exactly what this phrase was used to qualify in Xenophanes' work. Many people believe it was a kind of general statement. Then he says it follows on what we've just seen. So no one knows for sure about the gods and about all these things, but this is the best available. Um, I want to finish with two fragments that I think are particularly interesting. So here is one that um, I really like, and this is another example of Xenophanes imaginative use of thought experiments. It says, if God had not made green honey, they would have thought figs much sweeter. So what we've got here is Xenophanes imagining a honey free world. So just imagine a world in which there's no honey whatsoever. What would be the consequence of that? Well, he says, people would have a different uh, estimation of figs. They would think figs are much sweeter. Much sweeter than what? Well, not much sweeter than honey, because we're imagining a honey-free world. Rather, I think the point is that in a honey-free world, people would think figs to be sweeter than they currently think figs are, in a world that does contain honey. The point here, I think, is that our estimation of the sweetness of honey and indeed the sweetness of figs is contextual. We think uh, that figs aren't very sweet, in part because we know what honey tastes like. And so our, our, our beliefs about things are often contextually dependent. They depend upon a context here, 
our thoughts about figs depends on a context in which we can have honey too. And perhaps similarly, you might trace that back to their thoughts about the Ethiopians and the Thracians and indeed the Greeks, where their views about the gods are too contextually dependent. They're dependent about their own, on their own appearances and assumptions about the likeness between men and gods. I want to finish, at least for now, with another one of my favourites, just because I think it's a rather lovely sentiment. Like many early Greek philosophers, Xenophanes also had views about the heavenly bodies, what they were made of. This was one of the things you had to do if you were to be a pre-Socratic. And his idea, his big idea is clouds. Things are clouds. Um, the stars are clouds. The Milky Way is a cloud. Lots of things are clouds. He's a big cloud guy. And here, too, then, you can see him kind of having... Um, a sort of deflationary account of the gods, here the goddess Iris. What they call Iris, this too is really a cloud, right? So when you hear um, uh, poets talk about Iris, it's just a cloud, it's not a goddess. But then he adds this really lovely addition. It's red and purple and green to behold. And I'd like to think that what he's doing here is making an important point, which is coming to realise that a rainbow is just a cloud in no way diminishes the beauty of the thing. It's still red and purple and green to behold. It's still something that we can enjoy, something we can gaze at and wonder at. Um, thinking of, uh, of, of a rainbow as a natural phenomenon, in other, in other words, in no way diminishes its beauty. It might even be thought to add, for, add to it. So that was my whistle-stop tour of Xenophanes. If Henry joins me again, I've got a, a question for Henry, then perhaps Henry has a question for me, and then we can begin thinking about um, questions uh, from the audience. So what I was thinking, Henry, is uh, you had an interesting take on that fragment that sometimes thought to say, I wandered around the Mediterranean for ages, as it were. I physically went from place to place performing and so on. And I think you had a nice idea about that uh, rather this might be a kind of intellectual voyage or a voyage of his thought in some proxy or other. It might be a voyage of his thought in the form of a text, or it might be a voyage of his thought in terms of him reading texts from all over the Mediterranean. And I wondered whether, because I would like this to be a kind of neat and consistent package, whether you thought that had anything to do with that picture of the God that we had, where God, as it were, it's better and more appropriate for God not to have to rush around to get things done. There's something a bit more august and um, and uh, honourable even to have a God that can get things done at a distance with his intellect. Yeah, absolutely. Can, can we go back to the slides where we're describing the, the God? Uh, this one? Yeah, exactly. So so on the left there, the... Um, the Hestheos fragment, we've, we've got it, the God who's similar to mortals, neither in bodily form nor in mind, right? Yeah. So you've got this classic Greek dichotomy of physical form and mind, two sides of the same coin. Um, and, and it's sort of a polar statement here, right? The God is completely different from us in these two ways that somehow include everything. And it seems very clear that, as you said, the two halves of the dichotomy aren't equally valuable or important to Xenophanes. So on the right, 25 there. So without toil, without moving his body as all, he somehow nonetheless manages to affect physical change through the mind, right? It seems that what distinguishes Xenophanes' God is its mind, right? The noose, that is what is most important to him. Um, he, his noose is so powerful that it somehow wouldn't be fitting wouldn't be worthy of epi prepa his existence to have him moving around in physical form so i'd like to think there is some sort of resonance here between um the most important quality of xenophanes which is his noose 
and the most important quality of his God, which is also the noose. So I did not know until I got interested in Xenophanes just how much you philosophers were interested in the process of becoming godlike. But if, if there's a godlike godlikeness to Xenophanes, it is on a conceptual level rather than any actual literal resemblance, because that's precisely what's being denied um, on the left side of the PowerPoint there, right? And the other the other fragment to bring in here that somehow, you know, neither of us mentioned managed to mention, though it's such a relatively long fragment, is fragment two, where we have Xenophanes talking about all the nice juicy honors that the athletes are getting in their cities. So they're getting free meals, they're getting, you know, exclusive VIP seats. And he says, this is this is wrong. This is generally regarded no mitso, the, the custom here is wrong because the, the benefits brought to the city by the physical achievements of the athletes are something small, some little source of delight. In contrast to the benefits brought by our Sophia, by our wisdom, by our intellectual powers, which gives the city a city a sense of well-being, you know me, and which makes the city richer. So there on the human level, I think we see the same sort of opposition between bodily form and intellectual power. And it's pretty clear on which side of the divide Xenophanes would place himself and which side turns out to be more important. And there's certainly some sort of rev um, some sort of likeness uh, between Xenophanes' picture of himself and his own excellence and that of the god. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about the Kreas. Oh, follow oh, up. Sorry, I'm just drawing on that. I mean, I wondered whether you wanted to put him in a bit more context. So this kind of interest in this kind of um, a, a, appropriate behavior, those the people who, who really deserve proper honor versus those who don't. I wonder how you saw Xenophanes against other sort of archaic poets. I was thinking of Solon, maybe, or Tertius, or people who who might be promoting a different kind of picture of the kind of person who who is deserving of honor than Xenophanes. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess the the other um, I'm sorry we're talking so much about a fragment neither of us managed to cite, but <laughs> alongside that alongside that Xenophanes two fragment where he's saying mind is most important the virtues of an athlete you know no great shakes in the end of things I mean he is running contrary to what must have been common social opinion as he points out the general custom on these things is entirely wrong and we can think of Pindar of Thebes you know my personal favorite poet who is writing grand celebratory odes about these athletic victors and in his telling of it, they are bringing major um, boons to the city. And if we wanna bring in yet a different um, version of what might be the most important form of verite, then Tertius, the Spartan poet, um, has this fragment where he says, you know, I wouldn't take any account of somebody if you were as rich as Croesus, as fast as the wind, better speaker um, than, who is it? Adrastus, I believe. What the only thing that matters is martial courage, right? Being able to stand there in battle and not be afraid of the enemy to fight on behalf of the city. So that opinion, by contrast, very much is what seems to be the centrally accepted Spartan opinion. So we've got a view of the most important value, the most important form of erita. But in the case of Tertius, it does indeed seem to be the, the vision of the highest form of excellence that's shared by the community. Things are different with Xenophanes. What he's holding up, his particular form of Sophia, it doesn't seem to be rooted in the community in the same way, right? And part of this much must have to do with the ways these poets are situated relative to political power, right? So I think there is a community behind Xenophanes but it is the private community of the symposium, the people who we choose to be there with us, we admit them ourselves. And then secondly, the community of whoever wants to read, reperform, and think about these things. So in terms of um, offering what are at least candidates for an authoritative vision of what is in fact the most important form of excellence, again, Xenophanes looks to me like a pretty normal Greek poet thinking about these issues. In terms of what his answer is, that seems to me distinct and unique and something that we can explain relative to the context that he's in.
can I ask you a question? Please, Professor Warren. All right, sorry, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't a softball. This is a question I genuinely want to know the answer to. Can we go back to the progress fragment? Uh, yeah, hold on. 21B, yeah. Uh, this one, yeah. Yeah, 18. So, so you, you, you mentioned quite rightly that there's a, there's a striking mix of optimism and pe pessimism here, right? So it is yeah. not the case that from the start, the gods sort of just show you the right answer and reveal <laughs> everything to mankind. So that is not the case, but it is the case that things can get better and things can get better chrono in time, right? That adverb's doing a lot of work. So when we turn to the optimistic side of this fragment about making progress, how optimistic is it? So is it the case that all human beings make progress over time, generally from generation to generation, century to century, you know, we progress and I'm smarter than Homer was 400 years ago and so are you now today? Or is it the case that it's smart people like me who make progress? Because on the one hand, it does not seem to me that Xenophanes is of the belief that human beings are generally enlightened, right? The plot of so many <clears throat> fragments are what other people think generally is wrong. In fact, here's the right answer. And yet, if I look at the Greek, I would have thought that um, the subject of the verb was just netoi, human beings in general. Yes, I think human that's beings right. in general by searching can find better. So how optimistic was Xenophanes about human intellectual progress? Um, that's a really interesting and, and, and good question. Um, I think I think he would be unusual amongst the guys I spend my time thinking about if he was um, generally positive about what the common views about things were. Um, most of these people, because again, if we think about the context, they're trying to drum up an audience, they're trying to bring people to listen to their poetry if the message is well you guys have got it going on and um i think you're probably on the right track that's that's not going to be something many people are going to stop and listen to no it still won't get you published no um i think here i would want to put a lot of emphasis on their tune tes mm. and that's as it were think about it almost as conditional so it's like if if they go searching they make discoveries. And the kind of searching that you have in mind might be of different kinds. So we might have seen some examples of the kind of Zertesis involved, the kind of searching, when Xenophanes, as it were, is making these imaginative uh, leaps, thinking critically about what he knows and what he thinks he knows and so on. But there might be a, a kind of even literal sense to this. So there's one of one of the interesting stories about Xenophanes is that he came to the view that um, I think this is right. He came to the view that um, things that are currently mountainous, those areas were once underwater. And how did he come up with that uh, uh, conclusion? Well, on on it's because he could observe shells in the rocks high up above sea level. And that's a good old example of a bit of empirical observation, a bit of searching, and then a bit of very straightforward inferential work leads you to show, well, if there are shells here, there must once have been water here. And therefore the world hasn't always been the way it looks. Mm -hmm. So I think there are cases where um, the kind of, and it will be kind of dependent on the, the question you're interested in. If you're interested in the nature of the gods, then the kind of questioning and searching you do will be of a different kind from if you're interested in a bit of geology or a bit of geography, the kind of in, in inquiry that you engage in is going to be different. But I think it's effortful. I mean, it's it's not not in the kind of free from ponos way that gods do things. I think you can't expect just to bump into truths uh, as you set foot outside your door. There's a bit of work involved. And even then, you might have to be rather cautious about the about the level of confidence you can have in your conclusions. Yeah, not not necessarily the truth, but a main on better. Right? Better, yeah. They You've get got the idea of degrees and proximity to truth that we saw in the epistemology. Exactly, yeah. That 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 um, improvement 
doesn't necessarily mean acquisition of knowledge. It might mean coming to a more consistent view of things. Mm -hmm. Perhaps one of the things that Homer and Hesiod get wrong is they have this notion of gods as superior to us, but then they make them do things that would get censure if they were done by mortals. And perhaps that's a kind of inconsistency that Xenophanes would want to bring up. So we've got a, um, one or two questions uh, in the Q&A. So um, one question is, does Plato reference Xenophanes explicitly? I suppose, I suppose I'll take this one. Um, yes, he does. I mean, one of the interesting things about the way Xenophanes appears in Plato is Xenophanes appears in Plato as um, uh, as the person he thinks of as the head of a different kind of tradition of philosophy from the one we've been thinking about. I think this is really, really quite fascinating, that as well as Xenophanes being hailed as a kind of father of scepticism, and so that trails through the tradition, he's also sometimes thought of as um, a progenitor of, of, a, of a, another um, train of uh, philosophical thinking that was associated with uh, uh, Magna Graecia, where um, Henry said he seems to have fetched up at least at some point. And that's the train of thinking associated with the school from Ilia, the Aleatic school, where um, members include Parmenides and then Zeno, who came up with the paradoxes. And the idea there seems to be that Xenophanes was considered to be ahead of this feeling that somehow all things are one, or he's a kind of idea that that everything only is one thing. Quite why he acquired this uh, is not so clear, but it may be partly to do with his, um, as you see in on the left-hand side of your screen here, this idea of, well, people discuss this, and I, I wonder whether, I mean, I'm going to ask Henry to say something about it in a minute, this hastheos, that this kind of oneness that he associates with this god, at least. And there's some quite interesting speculation about whether, in fact, Xenophanes thought of this god as, as it were, identical with the cosmos itself, that he's some kind of pantheist and so on. So the idea that he stands at this, the head of this tradition that sees all things being one I think is quite important. And that's how he appears in Plato, in particularly in the Sophist, um, where he's named. But I think um, I would want to make the claim that his influence in terms of um, anti-anthropomorphism, the moral critique of depictions of the gods, and even this thoughts about knowledge actually are, are quite pervasive by the classical period. And, and you can find all of those themes in Plato. But Henry, I was going to ask you about this fragment 23, because um, I, I've often puzzled about whether there's just a brute contradiction in the first line, mm. that one God, greatest amongst gods and men, and those people who've been trying to um, uh, get rid of that contradiction often say, well, that bit at the end of the line, the enter teoisi kai anthropoisi megistos, it's just a formula. It's the kind of thing you lift from the tradition. Um, does that um, does that wash with you, that kind of, as it were, uh, well, you don't need to worry about that? No, I think, um, can I say something about the Plato citation first? Yeah. It's striking to me, I mean, it, it, the idea of him as head of the Iliadic school if we import that idea onto the fragments, we go so wrong, right? That's striking to me. That that I guess what's striking me from a different set of research interests is that already Plato is anxious to construct these intellectual genealogies and figure out, trace the line of influence from one thinker to the next that usually ends with Plato being right at the end of it. Um, but and in, in, in the fact that it, it, it does seem to be not entirely well grounded in the fragments at all. Um, okay, but, but what you asked me about the hesteos. So absolutely, the entetheois kai anthropoisi megistos sounds like rock solid Greek um, traditional epic diction, but 
one of the things we know about traditional epic diction is in a primarily oral society, it's power to sum up the context of its typical use. And that would be to describe Zeus, right? So one thing that is going on with Xenophanes um, him, if I'll use that word, to this one god, perhaps greatest literally among other gods, or perhaps the only god, is that he's consistently transferring onto this very different from traditional deity, exactly the same language that had been used to describe the greatest traditional god, right? Even the idea of him shaking everything yeah. with the power of his mind, I think Xenophanes quite clearly there has in the back of his mind, Zeus, you know, shaking Olympus with his nod, right? And I would be disinclined to think that, you know, there's just an outright contradiction here. The idea of there being one powerful God who's capable of these things, perhaps even capable of everything, or at least affecting everything. If I think in the broader context of ancient polytheism, it seems that that could sit quite comfortably beside the idea that there are other gods. What's always puzzled me, though, and my unanswered question is, what do the other gods do, right? What is their role in existence if we have so much uh, attributed to the one greatest God, if is literally one God among many? What are the other gods doing? Well, quiet. I mean, I think I, I think that remains a bit of a puzzle. Um, it, it's, it's certainly the case that, um, for example, if you look on the left here in this fragment, you have multiple Theoi. In this fragment, it's their own. So I don't think it's... Um, it, it's at all required that we we think that Xenophanes was a monotheist. I think the, the weight of evidence is quite to the contrary. Indeed. On the other hand, what do these other gods do is a very good question because they're not helping us out. <laughs> um, they don't seem to be um, needed as auxiliaries to what the Hastheos does. So I think that's one of these things that I find deeply mysterious still about Xenophanes theology. Um, uh, and so I, I don't really have any further thoughts there. Would, it, um, would, it, would a way of rephrasing the difficulty be, how do we preserve polytheism without conflict between gods, right? Yeah. Because the way, the, the, the portrait that Xenophanes is sketching of this mind exploding haste theos, the one god, it doesn't seem like there is room for him to interact with other gods in some relationship of conflict or even subservience. What need would he have of them, right? Yeah, and so, also, I don't think, given the power associated with, with this one god, we don't need multiple deities because we need to distribute them through different parts of the world. So we have to have one looking after the sea, one looking after the air or something like that. That, that doesn't seem to be required anymore if we've as it were transferred the means of causal efficiency that god can have over over things would you would you want to so uh, thinking about these plurals and these singulars how much weight would you want to put on the singular in your honey free world thought experiment fragment um is, is that well, is that really interesting isn't it god? yeah that looks like there's at least there was a god who who um whose job it was to to produce honey whatever this is i mean it might even be and um, perhaps those who see the idea of this one god as being somehow identical with the world mm. you know another way of parsing this is if the world had not produced honey that would have been one way of thinking about it um very briefly a really interesting uh question in the q a which i feel I'm not going to have time to answer adequately, but maybe Henry, you can help me out. Was Xenophanes the first humanist? Do you where where would you locate humanism in these fragments if there is any to be found? Oh, interesting. Um where would I locate humanism in these fragments? Well it seems like um the God, the ideal that's held held up is um thoroughly and deeply rational. And what is best about human beings is the extent to which they approach this all powerful noose. He might be a humanist insofar as the freedom to think away from tradition and in universal terms, right? So I'd take us back to the lovely thought experiment fragments you were thinking about, right? Uh, 
what's left of the peculiarly Greek when we get done with that, right? Yeah. There, there exists no longer any sort of special privilege point of Greek of view uh, um, given to the Greeks in particular. You know, there's no special point to claim it except for the rationalism <laughs> itself. So there may be a degree of yeah. humanism there. If that's what I think that's right. Him. I would also like to say um, that he has, um, although he he seems to think that um, the acquisition of knowledge is effortful on our part, mm. it's down to our, our own endeavour how we go about acquiring knowledge of the world. So when he says, well, gods haven't just revealed everything to us. Yeah. I think that's a really important point. You don't, in, in your quest for knowledge, the thing to do is not to hang around waiting for some god just to show it to you. You've got to get out there. You've got to do a bit of zetesis, a bit of thinking for yourself. And well, I think that's, that's a really important sort of uh, message to take from him. So on the one hand, some of these fragments can sound incredibly doctrinaire, and we merely put forward as flat statement something as radical as the God as a whole senses, yeah. whatever that means. And yet at the same time, there is this level of epistemic humility to Xenophanes that well, right. we can never know. I suppose, to push back against my own point earlier about him being counter-traditional, I mean, one thing we can't lose sight of is how much Xenophanes' most radical insights really are building upon traditional things. Yeah, I think so it's very right. sort of relaxed, easygoing, epistemic attitude toward the gods. I mean, that is deeply traditional. You know, as Achilles says to Patroclus, maybe you're hearing me in Hades, maybe not. <laughs> so there is a tr strain of tradition here being um, uh, spun in an entirely yeah. original I'm sure way. that's right. Well, and that's another reason why I think it's rather important to have both a reminder of what he owes to earlier poetic tradition mm. and also a look forward. So thank you, Henry. I really enjoyed that. No doubt that's we'll okay. have more conversations like that in the in, in the future. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, very soon we will um, be able to announce um, the topics for our webinars next term. But please do get in touch with the faculty if there are things you think um, you would like to hear us talk about or there are activities in the faculty that you think would make a good session of this kind. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'll leave you now. Um, uh, we do appreciate the support of our alumni and you can always find out more about what the faculty is doing and ways in which you can be involved um, by looking at our website. But thank you. Have a really lovely evening.